Hello and welcome to this interview. My name is Chris Voisey. I'm a coach and facilitator in communication and presentation skills. Today, I want to welcome you to the Blue Frontier Path Academy. This, of course, is a learning platform for coaching and tutoring busy professionals at various levels or even their children at school level. One of our fascinating content elements, for example, is linking chess to maths, developed by one of our leading tutors, who is the international chess master, Mr. Watu Kobese. The Blue Frontier Path is uh, used as a learning platform for people of all ages who want to upgrade their educational level and find the support to be able to do that. So we might be looking at uh, an undergraduate degree or an honors, an MBA, master's, PhD, etc. The focus is the uh, today is the career of Professor uh, Mamoheti Pakeng, and we are very, very happy to welcome her. In fact, thank you very much for being with us, Professor. Thank you very much for giving us your valuable time. If I may just thank quickly... You, Yes, if I may quickly introduce you, obviously you're already a well-known personality, but uh, you hold a PhD in mathematics education from WITS, I believe, and you are obviously a leading scholar in mathematics education globally. I know that you've been asked to deliver many keynote talks at international conferences all over the world. Um, I know that you were the 10th vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town, and I believe that you are affectionately referred to as deputy mother by young students um, <laughs> around Africa. So maybe you can tell us something about that. But thank you very much. I know also that you have a sharp uh, social conscience and that you developed the Adopt a Learner Foundation, which is helping young people in townships and rural areas to acquire higher education. That was rather a long introduction, but thank you for being with us, Professor. I'm going to throw the ball into your court by saying, would you just tell us a little bit about your own academic journey, if you don't mind? Th thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for inviting me. I mean, it's um, uh, my academic journey is quite long, so I'm going to put it quickly. Just to say the 12 years of basic education I, I spent in seven different schools. And, and that's a factor, factor of growing poor uh, in apartheid South Africa and changing politics, politics changing constantly and parents looking for a be better place uh, for their children. So I spent it in seven different schools. As much as it looks like a disadvantage now, I think it, it actually helped the introverted me uh, get to make friends very quickly. Mm. Um, and then for after matric, I went to um, the University of Putatswana. Uh, I went to the University of Putatswana, uh, and uh, firstly, I registered for a BSc education. The interesting thing about the University of Putatswana is that all the degrees were professional degrees, because at that time, of course, Buputatswana was a homeland. It was a creation of apartheid, so we, we had a university and all the degrees were professional degrees. So there was no plain BSc, you had to do a BSc education. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And um, in the first semester, I failed chemistry. Uh, I was doing five modules and um, I failed chemistry badly. I failed biology not too badly, but chemistry very badly. Um, uh, but mathematics, I got above 70, 75 or whatever. And I passed three modules. One I failed not so bad, uh, but was biology and chemistry very bad. And I had to ask myself difficult questions after that end of the first semester. I had to do that because my parents were very poor. It's three of us at home, uh, my brother ahead of me, my sister was coming two years behind me. My, my dad had taken a loan from, from work. He was working for the SABC without metric. He was a program compiler. And, um, and my mother was studying with us. I mean, my mother started, mm. was a domestic worker started studying with us. So there wasn't money. Uh, lots of money going around. And so uh, my parents had said to me, this is a four-year degree. You only have four years to do this, this degree. So I needed to make tough decisions for myself. First semester when I failed that course, I, I, I asked myself, why did I fail? Before anyone asked me, and I, I was very open to myself to say, mm. I actually spent more time doing mathematics. And I asked myself, why am I doing that? Uh, and that was because I loved mathematics. So then I said, but 
why am I doing these other things? And that's the thing about an undergraduate degree. There are many modules that you do that you don't really like, but you mm. have to do them because mm. you need to pass. And so I thought, I don't need this chemistry. I don't need this biology. Uh, of course, if I repeat the biology, I'll pass it and I can pack them up. But chemistry, nah. And so I went to the counseling center. I went to the counseling center and, and I told them that I'm in a situation I'm not excluded. Uh, I can continue because I passed more than 50% of my modules, uh, but I have a problem with having failed uh, these two modules, especially chemistry, because what it means is that I'm going to have to increase my degree by one year. So I must first spend five years at university and my parents um, are not gonna allow me to do that. Um, I will either end up leaving after four years. So, and they said to me, so in this, or oh, why did you fail chemistry? I said, I failed it because I didn't make time on it, for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I'm, and will you make time? I said, Mm, I'm not sure if I like it enough to make time. They said, well, you we take physics. I said, mm, physics, my high school physics has got so many gaps. I don't think I'll pass it. They said, so when you don't spend chemistry, what do you do? I said, we see your maths. I said, I love maths. I'm here for maths. And uh, please help me get a degree as long as I have mathematics as a major. Mm. They said, that's fine. So mm. they sat with me and they said, well, the only option you have is to change your degree to a BA education. Uh, you'll be the only student, probably the only ever student, a BA student who's majoring in mathematics. I said, I don't mind. As long as the timetable works, I'm fine. So they said, well, then choose, choose uh, two other courses. One that is going to be an elective and the other is going to be your third major because education was a compulsory major. Mm. Math is a major that I choose. They said, choose another major and an elective. So I said, mm, elective, I choose psychology. Uh, uh, another major, I thought, they said, that major that you choose, you have to, it's, it has to be one that you know that in one semester, you'll take two courses of two semesters. So you've got mm. to be able to pay. So I took Setswana because it was my mother tongue. And I thought I'll be able to do this. And I thought I'm just doing mathematics. I'm telling this story because many people who are studying, they meet challenges and they think it's the end. They fail one course, then they think it's the end. But I'm also telling it because some people uh, are not very honest with themselves when things yeah. don't work. Yeah. Why is it that you're failing this? Uh, and it's important to be honest with myself. My honesty with myself helped me uh, to say, I don't even think I'll make time for chemistry. So there is no point. And what it meant that moving from a BSc to a BA education with the majors that I want and the maths that I want, uh, which is what I wanted from university, it meant that I will not wear a lab coat. Mm -hmm. A lab coat was a badge of honor because you're going to the laboratory. And mm -hmm. so, um, and my friends, it will be known on campus that I failed or I drop out of chemistry and biology because I'm not wearing a lab coat. And I felt that is fine. I live with that. And what I did then, wearing my jeans every time when I did, I practice my, my math, I would practice on my jeans. And I thought, I don't have a lab coat, but I've got maths on my jeans. My backpack had, <laughs> had my theory labs. I would write on it. I would sit in the coffee shop and I would write that because I wanted to make a statement that I may be in a BA class, but I'm doing maths because I was the only one in the entire university. And the university had never had a student who was doing a BA and Setswana as majors and education. And, you know, so, 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 but so. I, I substituted that as my badge of honor, but it helped me complete my degree in record time. Mm -hmm. And for my final year maths, I got a 74%. And so I continued with my post-grad adverts and I continued to do a mathematics education. And here's the thing, the only degree that I had full-time was my bachelor's degree because my parents could not pay for, for post-grad and there was no bursary to pay for post-grad. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did a, 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 my honors, a master's and PhD working with a family and a son. So it was full, I was a full person. And if wow. you know, if you're an African woman, um, uh, there's so many other responsibilities because you're working, but Every time there's a lobola, there's a wedding, there's a christening, there's whatever, there's a funeral, they expect you to be there to mm. peel potatoes, to feed people. <laughs> and, and so 
I had to make some tough decisions mm. when, as I was studying for my postgrad. Uh, and one tough decision was I'm not going to attend all of those events. Mm. Uh, my family is not going to be happy with me, but I live with it. When I finish, yeah. when I I go when I have time, and, and one day I'll be done with all of this and I'll be able to attend. Um, yeah. Especially when I got to master's to PhD, the decisions became tougher and tougher mm. uh, because it's not so easy to study whilst you're working and you're raising a family. Mm. You wanted you to know, say something uh, else? Uh, Professor, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by your story, and I thank you for your honesty, because it applies to yeah. so many people who would be watching this video. Even myself, I only did a BA degree in English and philosophy, but you know, yeah. the, the ancillary subjects you have to take um, to exactly. get to, through those three years, I failed a couple yeah. of them, and I thought, but they do not even interest me, and yet exactly. you have to do them. So you are speaking for what a lot of people might be thinking and and the your honesty and yeah. sharing that is i think highly valued also of course you're talking about the extraordinary lengths that people in this country have to go to i think particularly african women yes. uh, to to do all these yeah. things you talk about and then to get themselves qualified at the kind of level at which you are qualified mm -hmm. I just want to, so I thank you for, for sharing that picture because I think your journey is one that many people can identify with. Could I just ask the question mm. about uh, mentoring and support? You know, we, we, mm. we go through all these things not on our own, of course. We're part of a community, part of a family, whatever it might be. And there are people who help us achieve what we need to achieve. Mm. Um, mm. Could you talk a little bit about mm. mentoring? Uh, you know, what role has that played in your life? Um, ha have you seen yourself? I'm quite sure you've been a mentor to many people. Just talking the way you're talking uh, is mentoring. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about the concept mm. of the support one needs to get qualified and to yeah. get uh, educated? Yeah. Th thanks, Chris. That's an important point because I never talked about it. And I have to say that um, I don't remember any time in my life asking someone to be my mentor, mm -hmm. but I had a lot of mentors. And mm -hmm. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, in my undergrad, what helped me succeed was that I made friends in my class. Me, I choose the smart ones. I chose, there were um, uh, four young men, Happy Stole, uh, Cabello Masilo, Given Mabalani, who were very smart. They became my friends. I used to go study with them. And I asked, and oh, oh, uh, two of them have got PhDs, but they went for physics. They didn't go for maths. And, uh, but I, I made sure, so if you're doing undergrad, um, it's, it's, as long as you are studying, you've got to have people that are studying the same thing that you connect with mm. because you can share your questions and so on with it. Yeah. When, when I did my PhD, for example, uh, I, I was working, each one of us have our own projects, uh, but Tabi so Nyaba Nyaba and Melody Graven, who are both professors at the moment, one in Lesotho, one is in Australia, were my friends. Okay, and we worked together, we read together, we, we shared ideas because we had done a master's together. So the first thing, before you get someone, because the mentor is always someone who's ahead of you, I think value the people who are doing what you're doing and get your peers that you can work with. Uh, because it's easier. You can see that what you're struggling with, they're struggling with, and you can use some of the strategies that they yep. use to yep. succeed. And then I get to mentoring. You know, I, I I name a few mentors, but one of the key mentors that I had in my, my journey um, is Professor Jill Edler. And, and Professor Jill Edler, I've never asked her to be my mentor. I just, I just was attracted to her by how she was teaching us. She taught us at, at honors and, 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 and uh, she was my supervisor for my honors project. And then I asked her, remember at the end of the honors, I'm going to do a master's. There was another professor who, who chose me, wanted me to be supervised by him. And it feels good because people want him, but I want Professor Edler. And I asked her, she didn't ask me. I went to her and I said, I want you to be my supervisor. It's not because the other one was not good, but it's because I was attracted to Professor Edler's way of working, mm -hmm. way of engaging with us as students. That's, so what am I saying? When you identify a mentor, be clear about 
What is it that's drawing you to them? I never asked her. I, I didn't ask her to be my mentor. I asked her to supervise my research because you need a supervisor when you do research. And then I, I, watched, I used to watch her, how she does things. And, and because I wanted to be an academic, I used to think, I, I need if I need to know how to be a good academic, Professor Edler is a good person mm, to look mm. at. You know? And sometimes I would ask her, why, why are you doing this, right? So if you're going to uh, 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 have a mentor, find someone whose uh, ethical choices um, and career choices you admire, mm. okay? Ethical and career choices, you admire them and you want to follow them. Most people want... Um, the, someone who seems to be doing well, they're looking at material things, money or whatever, don't chase that. Mm. Look at the person. What is it? Be clear. What is it about the way they're doing their work that you admire? Because that's important. And then, so I chose Professor Edler for my master supervisor. And then I, I when I finished the master's, I remember when I was submitting and, and I popped into her office and I said, oh, prof, I'm done. And of course I was working, I was a teacher. I'm done. Thank you so much uh, for the supervision. I've just submitted. I hope it goes well. And, and she said, yes, I hope it goes well. And she said, so what do you plan to do? What's, why are you, what did you do in master's? And what's your, what do you plan to do? What's your dream? And I said to her, I want your job. <laughs> and she's like, I said to her, Prop, not your current job, but your kind of job. And she said, are you serious? I said, yes. And then she said, set me down. Remember, I have never asked her to be a mentor, right? But mm -hmm. I'm taking her as a mentor the way I relate to her. The way you relate to your mentor, you ask her questions, you show what you're interested in. They, in turn, will ask you questions because they can see you. So you are building this relationship um, uh, without them noticing that you are adult. I, I just find that it's much easier. Of course, you can ask them if you like, be my mentor. But I think the, the, the fact that you've asked them doesn't necessarily make the mentorship relationship work, but it's how you relate with them. Mm. And so Professor Edler said to me, well, if you want to be uh, my, if you want my job, it means you want to be an academic. And, and that means you've got to get the license to practice. I was like, mm, license to practice? She said, yes, you must get a doctorate. I was like, oh, I'm tired, Prof. I can't do this. That was 96. And I said to her, I'm taking a break, 1997. I'm taking a break. I need a break. I need to spend time with family. I'll see you in 1998. And she said, great. And of course, she recruited me whilst I'm not studying to work on her, on her research project as a research assistant, which was great. Like, not as a research assistant at the time, just as a as one of the members of the research group to come. Yes. She said, if yes. you have time, come in, do this. 98. She said to me, uh, the, at the, towards the end of 97, uh, you said you want to be an academic, um, uh, you, you, and you said you are starting in 1998. Were you serious? Do you want to start? And I said, yes, I've applied, whatever, whatever. And then she said, here's a deal. I want to employ you as a research assistant in the research group. You've been coming you know, as a member. Now I want us to employ you. Why don't you take leave without pay at your job? At that time, I was working for an NGO. And the NGO, at that NGO, I was a project manager. And this is important for people who are studying and looking to find a career. I knew I wanted to be an academic. I was a program manager, training math teachers all over in farm schools and townships. And she said, come and be a research assistant. Um, I, at that time, I had won a Mellon grant. Uh, she had encouraged me to apply a presidential educational initiative, a grant, a grant there. And she said, Look, your Mellon grant plus your presidential education initiative, 100,000, that, that, that. Uh, I have an NRF grant and I have this and I have that. Uh, we can put it together in a month. You can get this amount of money uh, because if you apply for leave without pay, you need to leave. And she said, will this be okay? Hmm. And I said, I want to go home and think about it. And I came back and I said, you know, and at home when I thought about it, I weighed things. I want to be an academic. These ones pay me more money, but it's not going to make me an academic. What do I want? I decided to make sacrifices. I said to her, I will take that. And this is not just about the money. I said yes to being a research assistant. Remember, I'm, an, I'm a program manager at my NGO, right? Now, being a research assistant means that 
you collect the, the readings, you get the room ready, you first book the room, get it ready. You are basically the servant of the research team. Mm -hmm. You make copies, you prepare. When we go for data collection, I'm the one who's preparing the teams and, and putting, at that time, that was 1998, guys. And um, you are, you, I was with the only black person. My friends looked at me, talked to me and said, Kheti, you are going mad. You have a master's degree. You had a good job. Now look at what you're doing, making coffee for people. And I said, I want to be an academic. And this that I'm doing is a way in for me. My way in was to go down from being project manager to being a research assistant. And I, I was very clear about what I'm going to learn because I've been working with Professor Edler. Remember, this is a person whose career choices I admire. I admire how she teaches. I admire her research. I admire this. She's been my, my supervisor and the way she works with us. When we go to the conference, she's like, you know, who do you want to meet? We get to the conference, she introduces you to the people, she leaves you with them and you must get on with it, you know? And, and she was successful. So if you have someone like that, you can emulate what they're doing. So mm -hmm. I didn't care that people said to me why people are using me because I, want, I, was, I wanted to be with an expert someone who's achieved, not just someone who talks about it, someone who had achieved it. And I thought, I'm going to learn. First of all, I'm going to be a good researcher. But secondly, I'm going to learn how to run a big research project and how to manage the money. Because if you're a research assistant, you do all of this. How do you manage a big team in a big project? So I'm going to be a hardcore scholar. And whilst I'm doing that, remember, I'm also doing my research, my PhD research. Uh, Professor Edler was teaching master's student and she would say to me, do you want to come to class with me? Because she knew I wanted to be an academic and I would say yes. Um, and then she said, do you want to take next week's class? I mean, it's like she's dumping, you can say she's dumping her work on me. I thought I'm getting experience. Of course I want, I want her job. So, so I would go, you know, and she would be in class and I would take uh, half of the lecture, whatever. So, at that time, remember, I'm paid only as a research assistant. I had taken leave without pay for six months. At the end of the six months, um, she said, we still have more money, we can go for a year. Do you want to negotiate with your employer? I did. At that time, the person who ran the director of our NGO, uh, uh, Professor Jackie Nodier said, at that time, I knew you are not coming back. And so I went on for the next six months. Um, and in that next six months, uh, the math department adverts advertised a tutor job. Remember, I was pro pro project manager. Mm -hmm. And Professor Edler said, did you see that they advertised a tutor job in the math department? Do you want to gonna apply? I applied. I got the job. My salary had gone down. Um, my, my gross adverts was not even equal to my net where I came from. Mm -hmm. And I took that. Mm -hmm. Tuned my lifestyle to fit my whatever. What I'm saying is that you make tough, I made some tough decisions. Mm. Uh, I knew I'm not gonna buy any new clothes, no new furniture, no new car, uh, paid up my car with, and, and that, that was it, small little car. At that time, my friends are medical doctors, they are physiotherapists, they are teachers, they, they are advancing and I wasn't advancing and I went on because I had found someone who's a mentor who I can follow. And so mentorship, Chris, is irreplaceable. And here's the thing, starting from 1998 with a, a PhD, which people take forever to do, 2002 in June, I submitted the end of 2001, 2002 in June, I graduated and I graduated with my two friends that I told you about, mm -hmm. Tabiso and Melanie, mm -hmm. we graduated together. And they were, we were very good together in that a support team. But when we walked on stage, I got a career. They got PhDs. What am I saying that? I, didn't, I wasn't just getting a degree. I had worked with a large research team. We had gone to conferences through the research project. And I had they published, presented at international conference. The research project, because I was a research assistant, 
I had co-authored three chapters in a book that the research group produced. I had learned how to put together a book as an editor. Uh, and there we walked on stage together. We all had red gowns, uh, but they only got a PhD, which is amazing. And I got a degree, I got a career. And, and so the mentor that you get is critical, critical, that's, Chris. And, and that, just one thing about what makes the relationship work between a mentor and a mentee, that's also important. Often when you're a mentee, you, you can operate as if the mentor owes you training. Let me be clear, no mentor owes any mentee anything. They don't get paid, they do it, sometimes because they love their discipline. Now, you have to be worth meeting with them. Then they will even seek you out. And, and, and I related with Professor Edler in that way, make our meetings worthwhile. I always thought, what is she gonna get from me today in our conversation, what's she gonna get? Um, and so I read, I whatever, and she said to me, when you get this PhD, you've got to know more than me, then I know I'll, I've done a good job. The other thing that I did for my mentor is that I nominated her for awards. Chris, mm. every award that came, I nominated Professor Ed Lovell. She got all of, as long as I knew about it, I, I, she's not that kind of person who wants a college or whatever. I said, you, I wrote it and I nominated her. And uh, three years before she retired, I started, I gathered a team of people from international um, and we, I said, we need to write a book to celebrate the career of Professor Edla. Worked with her family, whatever. And then, boom, in Germany, we had a conference, we launched it, but she didn't know that we were working on this book. Her husband knew. And, and we published a book, a book celebrating her work. And what am I saying? Mentors are human. Mentors are human. They've, they've got, they need to be appreciated just like any other human being. So mentee, I know some mentees complain, they come to me and they complain, my mentor is not doing this, that, that, that. and I say, what is it that you are doing to build the relationship? Mm -hmm. Relationships succeed only on the basis of reciprocity. I was just going to say, that's the word, reciprocity. I mean, what you're, you're talking about, a reciprocal relationship there where you don't exactly. just expect things to be done for you. I love what you're saying. It's really interesting because there are a couple of things that, that just fascinate me. The one is you're talking about your goal and your objective. You know what you yes. wanted to get and where you were Absolutely. going to. And I think very often yeah. with people learning or students, they just kind of like just trying to keep their head above water, just trying to cope. But yeah. to have a clear picture of where you're going, you've painted that so beautifully Good. for us. The idea of a goal and objective. And what you've also painted is this really interesting reciprocal relationship where you are feeding into your mentor as much as they are feeding into yeah. you. So yeah. um, thank you. Thank you. And very making much. sacrifices, making sacrifices. Yeah. You've got to make, got to be willing because nobody's going to reorganize your life. The, you'll be your time will be demanded everywhere. Your parents, your sisters. At some stage, you say, I can do that. And then they will call you names. That's fine. They called me uh, Mulungu. My relatives call me Mulungu because I'm never there for everything to peel and to whatever, you know. And you've got to accept. And I tell myself it's gonna end. And one day, one day, they will they will appreciate what I'm because they will get the honor from the honor that I get mm -hmm. when I get a PhD or I succeed. You know, uh, uh, Professor Pekang, I just want to say this has not been an interview so much as like a master class in having the right yeah. attitude towards your studies, towards getting what you want. So I really want to thank yeah. you for that. I'm looking and I see that, in fact, we've only got a couple of minutes left. We're running out of time. Yeah. So thank you very much. I think you've just presented us with a wealth of information that people can take on board and think about in relation to becoming a success, as, as you've indicated to us, and hanging in there, sacrificing paying the price as you have done to get to where you want to go. So do you have a last word for us? Because I think we need, now need to close off. We only have a couple of minutes left. Yeah, look, it's been great. It's been, it's been wonderful. The thing is, you've got to know it is your career. It is your life. So you have to build it. 
Nobody is going to get that degree for you. It is your degree. Do all you can to get it because nobody is going to do it for you. But all the best with your studies. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you so much for your time, your valuable time you've given us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks.